Okay. So I guess this is my show at the moment. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so as of last evening, I pushed uh, to the repository, you know, uh, basically a version of an XML file that is the merge of the one that I received originally from Sue uh, that uh, G had started working on. And uh, <clears throat> you know, Randy's stuff started some editorial changes to uh, rearrange things. Let me go ahead and project just to have a talking point. One moment, please. I do not see a share screen icon. I do not know if I have permissions for that. You have I'll to have the ball. Give you. To hand the ball to, I'm looking to hand the ball to Jeff. Hold on while I look for a breath. Any place where it might be? It's over in the participants. It's next to you. It, you're, to IDR working group and the participants on the right side of the screen. And just okay, drag, so I can drag and drop the ball it. To yeah, I drag and drop it. You got the ball, Jeff. I am now the presenter. Okay, that's a good start. Um, and the actual presenting button is up on the up on the top uh, top on the menu bar on the top on the left side. Ah, actually, use the share, share my meeting window. Let's try that. Uh, that's not the screen I care to share. Let's switch that. Well, it's going to force this window, and that's fine for the moment. So let me swap things around. Okay, uh, do we actually see? A screen of text. Nope. I see a big white box and nope. that's it. And it says viewing oh, Jay Haas's thing and you're sharing your WebEx something. I see a mouse moving around. And now I can see Eddie. You haven't it seems like you're sharing the WebEx meeting itself, not sharing the Yeah, that's content. Trying to address that, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Try this one more time. I'm just shouting because I don't know if you can actually see what we, you know, what we're seeing. I appreciate the real time feedback. So in my share window, I do not have anything besides share meeting window. I do not have a share content web browser, et cetera. So that's why we're having problems. Uh, if you're using a Mac, you almost definitely need to go off and give WebEx screen sharing permissions. You First, do do, do, do share there. content, do share content and then pick the uh, content. Uh, Warren's comment is probably correct in that the permissions are you know, ratcheted down so that it's not working. Let me see if I can actually alter that without restarting this meeting. A moment. Otherwise, yeah, the share content idea or share scroll down to where you see share file, other apps, new whiteboard or iPhone would possibly do things for you as well. So security. Hey, technology, awesome. How many engineers does it take? You guys uh, see mine? According to WebEx 11. Here, 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 you can go, if you can see my window, you go to here, go to share content. AC, you're not open. The, the yeah. issue is uh, my security permissions on my box. Oh, okay, this okay. Is, this okay. is like the six different uh, meeting application that uh, I'm having to do this dance for. Yeah. yeah. Is. I believe that the share content one doesn't actually require permissions because you're not sharing your screen. You're sharing a file itself. Mm -hmm. Which I think is where people were getting with that. Okay, so let's see here. Looking for my screen sharing application. Developers. Isn't it always great how when you're trying to make a presentation or share content, everybody feels the need to start telling you how to fix things? Mm -hmm. Or while being like, no, move your mouse to the left, up one, down. That's not a click there. 
No, actually, the thing I could use help looking for is inside of the Mac permissions exactly where it's hiding under the privacy. Um, system preferences, security and privacy. And then over on the left, it's called screen recording. And for some reason, those are not sorted in any useful manner that I can see. There we go. Cisco WebEx. And it will tell you that as you've granted a new permission, you need to restart WebEx. Okay, I will be bouncing the session back momentarily. Okay. Well, Jeff's gone, we can talk smack about him. Uh -huh. Anybody <laughs> want to recite a poem? Or... Here as well, so. Pardon? Did anybody want to recite a poem or sing a song while he's uh, reconnecting? Far out in the uncharted. Oh, he's back. Never mind. So let us try by the bell. one more time. Apologies for the thing. So share content. There we go. I have screens that I can share. So I'm screen to share screen number two, which is what I want to do. And let me go ahead and shove the uh, window over. And do people see text? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you for the lost five minutes of life. Um, so what I have uh, done is uh, choose, chosen to take uh, a little bit of Randy's text, which was a little bit cleaner, uh, a little bit of G structure and uh, rearrange things a little bit. So uh, the key bits of work that I did up front uh, that are easy for the meeting right now is that uh, you know, we've put things into a problem scope where we're talking specifically that this is for you know, data center networks and that we're not precluding other things and that we're not going to not analyze them, but that work will be done elsewhere. We're trying to say that uh, we're keeping this simple. Uh, I think uh, the word we'd use for this is paucity. We want to actually keep this as a very uh, simple, very fundamental uh, set of uh, machinery to discover sessions, I don't want to try to put everything in the sun under here, um, or at the very least have that for the BGP piece of stuff. Whether or not we actually put this into stuff like L3DL or other protocols is uh, part of the longer discussion. I have uh, squished together two of the different uh, pieces of state that we had uh, into one section. Uh, so one of the things that's in here is that obviously for data center purposes that we care about V4 and V6. Uh, we will have to have a longer term discussion about uh, what this actually ends up meaning uh, for non data center applications, especially if you start looking at other families like EVPN, which are becoming popular. Um, the fact that we can do peering either on interfaces or via loopbacks, uh, something that we have long discussed, just now condensed to one spot. I've tried to condense things down into transport protocol endpoint properties and things needed for that. So like authentication lives there, liveness mechanisms such as BFD lives there. Uh, interesting question becomes if we start talking about uh, integration with other bits of plumbing for non ethernet. Uh, I also put GTSM in here since that was a thing that we largely expect to be used, but uh, we had not really discussed. So that is a new addition. Uh, properties of the BGP session or session parameters as I'm putting it here, like the AS number set, uh, BGP identifiers, and supported AFI SAFIs. And I have chosen uh, for at least this pass of things to uh, talk about a number of things that we've had in the, in the various proposals, either called groups, some people have you know, called them different things, but effectively a way of uh, advertising the device roles. Uh, we'll have to figure out what wording we want to actually have for this. Uh, this is an attempt to say that a device role is we're trying to describe the minimal information that the discovery application needs to provide for you to say whether or not you even want to try to peer with this thing. Once you actually know you want to peer with it, the whole point is that we're going to defer all the rest of the work down to the BGP open machinery. So. The device role thing I think is going to be interesting because that's going to provide uh, sort of like the transport and uh, peer selection hints. Uh, so it's basically a bridging item or foreign key or you know, pick your terminology of choice that allows you to be a little bit smarter about trying to not open a BGP session to everything that happens to be discoverable. And as we start discussing things like uh, the scoping of the transport, I think that's going to become a little bit more obvious. Had that discussion partially before. 
I try to split out the fact that uh, you know, what we really have is you know, transport, you know, a protocol uh, transport requirements. So the state we have above can go in lots of different things. Part of our discussion is, you know, we have several proposals that carry this type of state. We have to decide uh, whether we want one or more for a given profile for various reasons. And we'll sort of briefly touch on uh, the different uh, proposals and sort of how they bucket. Uh, that's the piece of cleanup work that I did not complete before this meeting. Um, but the relevant point here is uh, just sort of uh, using BFD as an analogy. BFD is a very simple uh, packet format and it gets stuck into same protocol, but in some cases bootstrapped by many different things. And I think that is probably where we're going to end up with for at least uh, several use cases. I haven't touched the operator configuration uh, section because uh, it needs a bit of cleanup. Um, I've tried to condense down the design principles a little bit, and this is where my cleanup uh, partially stopped. But the critical things that overlap discussion points we've had before, um, we have effectively, uh, G had originally put this as network layer. Um, the way I'm sort of describing it is, uh, uh, so your mic is open. Um, is uh, the uh, scoping requirement of where your discovery mechanism needs to go. So as an example, we have proposals that cover layer two, layer three, and layer seven. Um, I didn't get the layer seven example merchant here. And you know, part of how G put it is, you know, what does the discovery protocol do as part of interaction with BGP? Um, what we want, I think, you know, sort of condensing out of uh, the prior notes and a little bit of our discussion, we want the discovery mechanism to be generally independent from BGP session establishment. So that means that uh, you, sh you shouldn't have to do BGP uh, finite state machine stuff uh, to discover the same session you're trying to peer over. Um, because there, there's too many pieces of information that's a bootstrapping requirement. So the intent of the first item is try to say uh, bootstrapping requirements for a session need to be clear uh, as part of our mechanism. Um, the second one is intended to say that uh, we generally should not have the discovery mechanism uh, impacting the BGP protocol aside from setup and potentially removal of the sessions that we're discovering. And the setup, I think everybody understands. The removal specifically being called out here because uh, as one of the examples of draft shoe uh, has uh, as part of its machinery being very much like LDP, when you lose the discovery protocol, the intent is that the session goes down. So this is a di one of the discussions for the group. And there's also uh, the case where we may use existing sessions you know, for discovery to do things. And that's uh, you know, one of you know, Robert's uh, proposals. I'm going to pause here to see if there's commentary on the uh, the metas up front before we sort of hit uh, some of the analysis of the breakdowns you know, for the candidates. I have a quick question. So do you know what harm would it make if we just limit this to L2 without L3? Uh, yeah, and actually uh, your point, Robert, uh, this this is sort of a bridging topic between uh, the metas and uh, what we may want out of individual protocols. Do you mind deferring that uh, for a second? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Any other commentary on the stuff up front? Because uh, Robert is heading directly into where I think we need to talk about the other stuff. This is Sue. Okay. Sue? Security. Uh, to these upper requirements as far as securing and validating. The Shahu and some of the others had validation of portions of the protocol. Um, so we have uh, two sets of security. Uh, the first set is uh, specifically for uh, you know, B2B session establishment. And I'd actually meant to call this out, but uh, this is part of the work that I hadn't done. And you know, my, my response to you this morning, Sue, is mostly to point out that there's a lot of stuff that's in my notes that haven't made it to text yet. So, um, so PGP session establishments, one of them, and there's also uh, 
you know, auto discovery protocol. You know, security and I think uh, the requirements right now have sort of distilled down you know, that for the bootstrapping information for the protocol to sorry for bootstrapping the BGP sessions. We do need enough information for the transport to figure out what we're doing. So if you're doing BGP, uh, am I doing MD5? Am I doing MAO? Am I doing IPsec? You know, so those are things that we need to know for us to even try to bring up a TCP session to the appropriate device. Uh, the thing I haven't mentioned uh, because I th it's absolutely related to the requirements, but it's re uh, not a requirement of the state for BGP. It's for securing the protocol, the auto discovery protocol itself. That itself has security properties. So, like L3DL has uh, a well thought out section on what it's supposed to do for itself. It's a little bit thin on what we need to do for BGP, and you know, pretty much every proposal is a little thin on what we do for the BGP session itself. That's sort of understandable. Um, past that point, I think the rest of the uh, proposals to date really haven't spent a lot of detail there, and we absolutely do have to talk about that. Um, Warren, and you asked for what, what are the open uh, pieces? The other thing is, as you go toward a transport that's multicast, which I think um, there are two other pieces I had uh, noticed in what I think you've covered in the choir requirements, but you may tell me that uh, section. The question is, uh, what about not just uh, for security, uh, but when you get to the end and you're saving information, there is syntactical or there is contextual validation of the information that goes to PGP. What I think you just told me is that's later or that was covered. I'm not sure. Where, where, if you think it's been covered in the in them. So, if I'm grokking what you're asking correctly, um, the the transport uh, mechanism has its own security properties. Most mm -hmm. of the auto discovery protocol has the state that you need to discover BGP sessions and decide if you want to peer with them. Uh, most of that's pretty boring BGP stuff. Here's my peering endpoints. Here's my AS numbers. Uh, here's my security properties for things like: Do I need to turn on BFD? Do I need uh, GTSM? Do I you know what what sort of uh, uh, encryption do I need on my TCP session to get the session to even to try to come up? Uh, the piece that I think hits the next bit is there's the bridging piece of how do I tell my discovery protocol uh, something about the session that I want to peer with that is interesting so I can help choose whether I want to do it. The easy example that we have out of BGP Clove Fabrics is, you know, if I'm a uh, aggregation layer, uh, you know, depending on how you count uh, things, you know, level one, level two, uh, I may only want to peer with things that are, you know, a different level than me, as an example. Mm -hmm. That is a piece of information that can go into the discovery protocol uh, to provide the hint of, well, this is somebody I may need to care about, Past that point, you know, sort of going back to the simplicity principle of where Randy was trying to drive things, we should take anything other than the bare hints that we're providing to the selection process and leave the you know, other interesting things about the protocol to standard BGP state machine stuff like capabilities. So the in in if you're looking at the, this as transferring data using some sort of transport. The thing that I had just heard was the data. Uh, uh, you're basically, we have an idea what the data is, and because we have an idea that it's an ASN or it's an IP address, that we have some concept of what the syntax, syntax of that should be. Mm -hmm. And the contextual, which was the thing that you just mentioned, where you look at is this guy got the role and actually uh, after thinking uh, like your concepts of role 
at multiple levels. Is this guy got a role in the cloth fabric that's at a higher level than I have? And if so, I might want to peer with him because I'm going to get information. If he's below me and I already have something, that's some other information. But that that role has also is this the right syntax over the wire, and then is this the right context? And I think correctly put syntax in the protocol and some level of context to get the BGP up, but the rest of the role context clearly in the BGP open statement. Did I understand what you just said? Yeah, you did. Uh, and <clears throat> what I'm sort of expecting is the next uh, evolution once the document sort of hit uh, you know, fully complete version one, uh, the information that I'm calling state will eventually be you know, sort of like the general information model of what we're passing around. And you know the implementations of that are going to obviously be in the different protocols, and you know very likely, you know based on how we're doing stuff in IETF these days, there'll be a Yang module that describes that piece of state and can be incorporated into, you know, various things as a you know, Yang grouping as an example. And you've done a nice job of laying that. Here's the crossover in the requirements that I still had trouble with, um, and. Uh, again, before I say all of this, I just want to salute the fact that you and Warren have done a tremendous step forward in this document. I know there are more steps, but every I'm cheering the first step forward. So please, thank you for that. The other thing that has a mixed security issue, if you're transferring this, and I'd like it link level information. Robert correctly indicated that perhaps we should be only passing uh, layer three information and should use a multicast. And by the way, Robert, I, I like the idea of, uh, of IP multicast, but how do you, you know, how do you, if you're going to pass information about link level, is there a security issue? Again, same thing. Is that a requirement? Is that something we look at later on down the pike with the transport? I don't know the in what's link level information and how secure you need it versus the transport. And I'm really trying to focus specifically on the information first and leave the transport to later. Well, um, this this is the second time we're poking at uh, what Robert's originally asking, so let, let's move that direction. But I am going to pull out one specific point that's sort of another bridging piece for security, which is we want to avoid unnecessary disclosure outside of the scope of things that we're giving. Because you know part of the reason why we don't just uh, this is sort of discussing uh, to you know Robert's proposal for we basically stick the open message directly in multicast is sometimes people don't want to tell every single thing that your routing session is going to be able to do. Like if, if you're, if I'm not going to let you pull up a BGP uh, transport session uh, for TCP to come up before I even send you an uh, open, there are, you know, there are people that just simply will close the session without actually telling you anything about it because they don't want to give you information about what this, the box is doing. Uh, this is sort of like the uh, discussions that we came up with the BGP version number stuff that we've had in IDR the you know, uh, last couple of months as an example. So the nice thing about a transport role is you know, that's effectively a bit of semi-opaque information. You know, if you're using a well-defined well number, you know, like this number means that this is a clo fabric you know, aggregation node, you're obviously providing information. Where this becomes uh, applicable to the next piece of the conversation is, well, where is your security boundaries? What's your where's your places of trust? You know, as Warren likes to point out. Um, and when we're looking at our transports, what we have you now basically is L2 and L3. And the the thing to look at from those for at least the carry, you know, the transport purposes of carrying, you know, the state is really what are we uh, using it for scoping? rather than, uh, Warren, we're, you have an open mic. Did you want to say something? Um, no, I think I'm just going to, I guess, just going to add the fact that there are likely to be some sets of roles or states which are well known and understood. Um, and if 
you know, and you can stuff those in. But if you're the sort of person who cares about disclosure, or if you just have devices which perform odd roles, like, you know, this is an encapsulation device which carries stuff off of the network that you should learn about. Um, those can be additional sets of role tags. So chances are we're more, you know, a consideration is we end up with two parts of a namespace um, or code space where, you know, one through 1,000 are well-known, 1,000 through 2,000 are user-defined slash private use type things. But, exactly. okay, cool. Nope, we're, we're in agreement. And, you know, I guess uh, relevant to the point that we're making, if you don't want to use the well-known point for, uh, you know, like, clo fabrics, you know, for some sort of security reasons, you can go for a level of security through obscurity by choosing your own point. And, you know, the, the you know, recommendation I would typically make when we get to the uh, PDU format is, you know, the number of things we want to reserve to IETF for well-defined roles is probably relatively small, and there should be a large code space for um, you know, first come, first serve, you know, for people that just ask for them, you know, they get defined by IETF, registered IETF, but the, the majority of them should be available just for user uh, purposes. Um, but sort of taking this as the next point about scoping, um, back to our transports, we we have uh, two uh, scoping contexts that I think we care about here. You know, people keep on saying, "Well, multicast." Well, we're, we're talking about multicast in a couple of different contexts. You know, we have link, uh, L2 multicast, um, and we have uh, you know IP multicast. And to some extent, that already gives at least one level of uh, consideration. So, like one of the message threads Robert was asking, you know, could we restrict this you no know, simply to point-to-point -point links as an example, and the problem is, you know, that depends on what you mean, you know, by uh, point to point and how modern you intend that to mean. Uh, so if you're talking about you have something that is literally something that does an old style T1, that is literally a thing that connects between two boxes and doesn't really have any uh, life uh, outside of that. Well, that's very well defined. You know that if you put a packet on uh, that wire, it's going to go exactly one place. Uh, you have you know, the old style non-broadcast multi-access, you know, like frame relay, um, or if we take you know, EVPN as an example, if you're a link that's talking EVPN, really it's, despite the fact that it looks like a broadcast domain, uh, it's really an MBMA in terms of how it goes across the actual network. You just can't see that. And then you have you no know, old school IP multicast, which is, well, I've sent this thing out with a magic MAC address and it gets distributed to everything that happens to be, you know, if it's uh, you know, ideally all routers, it hopefully goes to only the things that are supposedly on that link. But your case sort of shifts there from, uh, do I care about this being to one entity or to multiple entities? Robert actually gave good cases for both. And that's where the discussion here, I think, has uh, two relevant points. The first one is if you care about this thing only talking to the thing at the end of a wire, we're probably looking at an L2 type solution. And you know, LODP has that, uh, and so does uh, L3DL. If you care about talking to a thing that happens to be attached to the wire, you then care about by talking to one entity or multiple and how that actually impacts things. Now, if you're trying to build a fabric, it's probably a configuration error of some sort for you to actually uh, discover more than two additional parties on the wire. If you're trying to build something that's uh, you know connecting edge nodes as an example, that's perfectly fine. This protocol needs to be able to service both of them, but that means that you have to sort of work through the transport implications. You know, am I talking to exactly one thing, many things? What are the error conditions if I have a mismatch? And do I have enough hint in my transport protocol like that device role to help make a Y selection or do error correction for it? And, and this is Warren, just a quick thing to add to that. Um, obviously this is a place where we need working group feedback as well, you know, as with everywhere else in the document. Um, but this central, this is sort of one of the more central questions in that it um, drives the level of complexity if our solution were 
or if our problem space were purely point-to-point -point links where we know that there's definitely only one other thing on the wire. The um, solution space is much simpler than, well, this could possibly be lots of devices that can only get certain types of traffic, right? sort of the EVPN type um, space. There's also a related thing on um, how much additional complexity are we willing to deal with in order to solve what could be considered sort of side cases or pathological cases. Um, if it's, you know, I will use EVPN as another example, if it only carries certain types of traffic or doesn't really replicate a broadcast network very well, are we willing to deal with additional complexity in the BGP autoconf stuff to support what could be a very small um, number of users? But how much additional complexity do we want to solve for, for corner cases? Um, and that's a design team question, I think. Hopefully I didn't take your flow too much away while going down my soapbox run. No, this is not meant to be, be pontificating. It's just me trying right. to structure the way I have. Sure, I just don't want to, you know, break your flow. Right. But I, I think you actually, you know, uh, indirectly hit into it. Like one of the things I thought I'd add to the prior section, but uh, either skipped over, or it's not in the version I posted. Um, is extensibility one of the dis, uh, discussion points that we will have to have is what level of extensibility mechanisms we want in the auto config. Uh, you know, Randy is a example is not terribly fond of putting in more extensibility than necessary, but you sort of, I, I personally find that uh, it usually saves you later on if you're planning for it, even if you don't use it immediately. Uh, but sort of in the related aspect, uh, that also hits the simplicity versus complexity discussion. So, Robert, I'm not picking on you, but I'm going to use it as an example. Uh, the BGP open over multicast you know, has a lot of appeal to it because obviously if you have code that has to be able to open up a BGP session, you already have the parser no code for the stuff flying around. But we end up with an interesting mismatch that uh, depending on you know, what ends up in that open message capability-wise as an example, uh, how much does the you know, discovery protocol need to sort of stay in step with, you know, BGP features. BGP open messages don't evolve super often, but when they do, you know, it tends to actually be a big jump. Since Robert's not responding, uh, I guess I'll move back to, so we're, we're looking at you know, the scoping of where this stuff goes and deciding whether or not we have enough information to know if this is a, uh, a valid scenario for what we're trying to do. Am I talking to one thing? Am I talking to many things? You know, is that okay? Uh, past that point, most of the stuff in the various protocol me mechanisms fall down to a couple of interesting headaches. So at the L2, um, the question sort of becomes, where are you fitting versus uh, things that may need to be part of bringing up uh, not only BGP sessions, but potentially uh, interacting with the components that bring up IP itself. Uh, this is one of the things that the CARP working group ran into when I was trying to specify all these fancy you know, routing security things. You, know, you can't get something that looks like you know, uh, IPsec Ike to come up until IP's really been bootstrapped, but some of the protocols they wanted to secure you know, needed IP to be up before it could even happen. In the case of you know, BGP discovery, you know, there's less in the way of requirements, uh, although LSVR is trying to actually go down that path to some extent. Uh, it, you know, it's providing a, a sort of a nice you know, generic framework for doing uh, discovery of addresses that the, you know, its protocol can make use of. I don't think that uh, we actually need this for uh, BGP session discovery, uh, I think we're generally expecting that IP is far enough up that we're going to be able to do that sort of thing. But that said, you know, this is an example where, you know, like L3DL can carry the state, you know, from the information model that's earlier in the document, uh, perfectly fine as part of its mechanisms and make use of things. So if L3DL you know, is there to bootstrap LSVR, you know, it could also be a carrier for the same information to bootstrap other BGP sessions. 
and where this sort of you know uh, eventually leads us as well is there may be more than one solution that we're wanting to provide a protocol for again using bfd as the analogy you, you can carry the same state in, in more than one way where things become tricky at that point is you have to have some sort of tie breaking mechanism you know robert also asked in you know the same mail you know could we just simply limit this ip multicast scope well if you're happy with the considerations of what you talk to how many things might be there and have a way to pick stuff you know in terms of you know these are acceptable sessions um the question then becomes uh well what happens if i also have a similar mechanism that just says i'm going to look at all of my you know uh, subnets that allow for exactly two hosts and now that to be a you know, bootstrapping criteria as well and you eventually have to do some level of tie breaking criteria you know can i tell if the uh thing i'm discovering in more than one way is the same pgp speaker and if so if i have more than one transport what do i want to do about that This is where I start to wonder if I've lost everybody. No, nope. this is where we, where we specifically say thoughts and questions. Yes. So, real strong question. If we could use IP mode casting, as Robert suggested, you know, that. That restricts things to a certain place because people have said, you know, if you get to multicasting for BGP open, uh, where what if it was the wrong place? And there's always a, a use case where it doesn't work, and there's always a use case where it does, which gets into two different transports. Do we use this to pass the information in one case? And what I really don't have in my head is of here are the things that if you used IP multicast, these would not work. So one, a, a quick thought, you know, this is Warren, no hats, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Um, I should mention my um, sort of disclosures first. I really, really like the IP multicast idea. Um, you know, I think Robert and I started off with a bunch of that um, with things like IDR Socialite and then Robert's document after that. So I'm biased towards that idea. My concern is one of the primary use cases I see for a lot of this is within a data center and specifically within a data center with a clove fabric. Um, and in many of these sort of initial bring ups of a so fabric, you have what look like switches. And so if you send an IP multicast packet, it goes to the switch that you're directly connected to, but because it's acting as a switch, it goes to everything else that it's connected to as well. And I think one of the things we really don't want to do is try and bring up or auto discover BGP sessions with everything in the fabric. Um, so that's sort of my primary or one of my primary concerns with IP multicast um, and the sorts of places where I think people might try and use this in the data center network specifically. Right. If, if I could jump in there, this is Kev. Uh, our experience have shown to that very point that Warren just said, IP multicast in a lot of data centers is non-existent. It's completely disabled. They don't even use it for anything. Um, and and for that reason, I think while it's a very neat technology, um, we should probably consider since we're focused on data centers, we, small or big, we should probably consider building something on top of the technology that probably is prevalent in data centers rather than. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is John. Um, how do you even use IPv6 without at least link local multicast? 
I'm not I'm not talking about link local uh, multicast on IPv6. I'm talking about IP multicast in general. The link local multicast is simply enabled uh, using uh, point on the point to point links, but there is no multicast. Um, no, no. So hey, we're, we are talking about L2 multicast. At least I'm talking about L2 multicast, which works point to point and pole to multi point as well. Okay. Uh, so. That's why I was trying to differentiate yeah. from IP multicast, particularly. Another comment, since I'm at the mic, uh, I want to say that we are using effectively uh, BGP as IGP. And why we should go beyond what IGP does for discovery here. Yeah, and that's, that's sort of the point I want to hit. It's like, uh, Robert, you're, you're saying that what you mean is effectively link local multicast. Uh, what's in your document is basically IP multicast. Yes, we, 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 we know yeah, that terminology. We, I'm sorry. I apologize for no, no, <laughs> wrong no, it's, no, it's actually important because, uh, you know, we, we know that under the covers that IP multicast is just sticking, uh, you know, stuff into funny L2, you no know, Mac addresses that uh, mm -hmm. expected to be the multicast range. And, you know, those of us who've had the misfortune to deal with, you know, uh, the way switches actually handle multicast, we know that in many cases that some well defined cases, uh, like all routers is an example. You know, this is something that probably will be served fairly well by the majority of you know, uh, switching elements, you know, and switch hardware. Uh, anything else that's more general purpose multicast, you know, good luck with that. That may or may not work depending on the hardware. And you know, in the really gross cases, even things like all routers uh, or you know, things like IGMP discovery may only work because it's a well-defined bit of uh, port space, not because it's to a specific address. So the the issue that yeah, we do know is that IP multicast in any flavor, even to something as generic as all routers, may not be as general as we'd like it to be. Uh, part of the discussion we should have is, you know, like I said, we can view this as a scoping consideration. You know that if you're using a L2, you know it's exactly going to you know what you expect it to. Whereas if you do it as an L3 multicast of some sort, the uh, spray is a lot wider and the deployment considerations are a little bit messier from a chipset, but uh, we may not just decide that we care about that. You know, we're designing what the protocol should do, and that's where you know, the people that are implementing the switch stuff need to catch up. Yes, Jeff. So, so basically, since we are talking about um, L2 for now, let's say, we can use broadcast as well, which every switch handles well. Uh, with exactly the same headache that uh, you know, Warren's sort of getting at, uh, you know, the, the the sort of shake the fabric noise you know, from bum traffic uh, it becomes a little bit challenging. Uh, just the time check, I do have a hard stop at top of our, uh, where I did want to leave, at least leave where we're at today from my perspective. Uh, this decomposition into the sort of uh, uh, Blast radius slash you no know, uh, uh, scoping constraints of what we do talk to is you know the next part of decomposition that we're gonna I was gonna do for the document uh, using the uh, proposals as candidates for that um, is that uh, is that still seeming like a good way to you know, carry this work forward because I, I think where this is gonna lead us is uh, here are the considerations that we have and you know we'll put the scoping sort of gains and loses for us in each of those situations. And I think that it eventually drives the conversation of, you know, one or more protocols. This works for me. Does is there anyone else that has issues with it? Uh, if Warner or Jeff won't call it, I will. Folks, anything? Any other thoughts, Gossick? Yeah, I think hey. it was kind of productive. Yeah, yeah that was good. Yeah, yeah I'm also leaning. I, I I would say that the layer two multicast seems to be having legs <laughs> to solve I, I, this. I think it will go both places. Where you know, where I sort of see you know the long end of this discussion after we've sort of dealt with the data center up front. Uh, to my analysis so far, the information model, what we carry in BGP would be useful for non-data center context as well. Uh, the uh, 
BGP discovered by BGP. That was uh, Robert's last contribution uh, that I added to this document. Is an example of doing that. Uh, AC and I have something where uh, you can discover route reflectors in OSPF as an example. So being able to carry this state in other things for bootstrapping further away, I think you know, uh, you know the work will be more generally applicable. So uh, that's that's a goal you know, of mine, uh, even though it's not necessarily a deliverable for the uh, work. So, Sue, are we meeting again next Tuesday? We will meet again next Tuesday, and I will probably withdraw the meeting exchange invitations and send out one with a clear one. Thank you for patience on that. Thank okay. you, Jeff and Warren, for your hard work. We'll see you all next Tuesday, and Jeff and Warren will put out another draft. Thanks again. If you have any feedback, please send it directly. And you know, uh, this is not meant to be you know a single uh, person editing everything. If you, Jeff, um, are you going to discuss the regarding the L three approach in next meeting? I know that we we kind of uh, today you have the presented that overall, and you are going over the L two. But uh, we you are in the L three when you come, there are uh, di different approaches, and you are going to discuss next week. Ah uh, yes, and uh, no, that's part of the scoping discussion. Okay, okay, that that that's good. So, uh, one, one quick uh, uh, comments, minor. Do do I have in that group in the Autocon group, or is it possible to add me? Uh, uh, Kasik, if you and Linda would stay on, um, you can self add yourself at this point, and Linda. That's okay. apparently what I. What I needed to check with uh, Linda and for the rest of you was the fact that um, is IPR rules. Okay, so everyone okay. can add themselves, and I will enable you as a poster. Because of IPR rules, I need to uh, uh, let you self add, and I'll just pause with that. If so, you and Linda should be adding self, Vim, uh, and if I don't see you added, I will add you myself. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will fix that. Okay. And I, Kasek uh, and Linda and Vim, if you will add yourself, I will try to have this all done within an hour. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, folks. See you. I lost uh, a few okay. minutes ago. Uh, hi, Sue. I lost uh, my uh, 